Good morning, everybody. Welcome to KLH Worship this morning. Special wo welcome if you have braved the weather and you're here in person. Well done. Welcome to you if you're watching on Facebook and welcome if you're catching up with us later on YouTube. My usual apology, I am the non-tech. I am not going to read out all your greetings on Facebook, but please send them because your fellow Facebook people can see them and we can see them later. For those who don't know, I'm Janice and I'm one of the worship leaders here. And today we're having what is known as a local arrangement, which means there wasn't a preacher available to come this morning. But I'm very happy to say that I have got a fellow worship leader helping me this, well, in fact, leading most of it this morning. Very pleased to welcome back Jane Willis from our church at Bushy, Bushy and Oxy. Today is the start of COP26, discussions on climate change. But I'm not going to talk about that now, because I think if you're going to talk about that, it probably needs to be after they've had their discussions, when we know what they said they're going to do. So I'm going to talk about the other significant day today. If you have been in the shops in the last few months, you will know that today it is Halloween. I spent quite a lot of my middle years not very keen on Halloween. I thought it was an American import and just an excuse for the sweets and costume makers to make a bit of money. So I was never really into it. But looking it up on Google, it is actually a Christian festival. So I have found 10 facts that you might be interested in to do with Halloween, courtesy of Google. The first one, Halloween happens every evening of the 31st of October. It marks the start of All Hallow Tide, which is actually a series of Christian holidays, and it's about remembering the dead, the ones you've loved, saints and martyrs. A lot of the current customs can be traced back to the patient pagan traditions of ancient Celts, and particularly the festival of Samhain, which is summer's end. And it was part of their preparation for the long winter. Now, most saints and martyrs days in the Roman Catholic Church are celebrated, were celebrated in the summer. But in 837, Pope Gregory IV moved All Saints Day to November, which does happen to coincide with Samhain, but it was a practical decision because Rome got so full of tourists that they wanted to spread it out a bit. So even in the 800s, there was tourist problems. By the 1100s, the festivities included street parades with criers in black asking people to remember the dead. And homes would bake soul cakes marked with a cross and give them out to the players in exchange for prayers. And it even gets a mention in Shakespeare in The Two Gentlemen of Verona. By the 1500s, the festival begins to include costumes and house-to-house -house visits. And this is when you get the youngsters coming round. They impersonated spirits and recited verses and songs in exchange for food. So if you get somebody knocking on your door, you might like to ask them to sing to you for a change. 
trick-or-treating comes from a medieval practice, that did surprise me, in which costumes actors paraded on the streets and performed in homes. And they used to do it not just at All Hallows' Eve, they also did this at Christmas and Shrove Tuesday and Twelfth Night. Halloween first appeared in Christian writing around 1745, the name Halloween. And it's a shortened form of the term Hallows' Evening and refer to the vigils and other activities the night before All Hallows' Day or All Saints' Day. I say, although I thought it was a major American thing, and quite a lot of people I think probably do, it didn't actually really start in America until the 1800s. And it came out of the mass immigration of Scottish and Irish people who brought their traditions from home with them. Now in Ireland and Scotland, they used turnips to make their lamps. I'm not quite sure how that would work, but anyway. But for the immigrants, of course, pumpkins were much easier. They're larger, they're softer, and there had been a tradition of using pumpkins to make decorations before that. And my final fact isn't really anything to do with the church, but it just amused me. The first Halloween-themed attraction opened in 1915 in England. It was called the Orton and Spooner Ghost House, and it was a steam-powered carnival funhouse. And you can still see it, because it's part of the display, display at Hollycombe Steam Collection in Lithook. So, what has this to do with today's service? Halloween is about remembering those who have gone before. Those people who have shown us what it is to love God. And that is part of what we're thinking about today. One of the ways we show our love for God is to come together and worship. So I thought I would finish my bit of chat by inviting you to do that now and sing. So you might want to stay seated for this. We're going to sing from Singing the Faith 24, Come, Now is the Time to Worship. And after we've sung, Robin will play some music to lead us up to our 10.30 start.
Good morning. It's lovely to be back with you here in Hemel this morning and to worship together with you. Our worship today is, as Janice said, drawing on the lectionary for this Sunday. And we're going to be thinking particularly about the commandments to love God and to love our neighbour as ourselves. A call to worship for this morning. Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come into his presence with singing. For the Lord is good. His steadfast love endures forever and his faithfulness to all generations. So come on, let's make a joyful noise and let's sing together our praise to the Lord this morning. Let's start with him singing the faith 21. Born in song, God's people have always been singing. I invite you to stand and sing masks on but lustily as we sing Born in Song. Please do sit. So, our opening prayers of adoration and thanksgiving. Creator of all, sustainer of all, saviour of all, 
your glory and majesty are beyond our understanding, your power too awesome to behold, and yet your love enfolds us as a gentle breeze. Saviour of all, sustainer of all, creator of all, we bless your holy name. This world is yours, planned in eternity, created in a moment of sheer exuberance, permeated with love, well made. This place is yours, in its simplicity, blue sky and countryside, pure creativity, painted with care, well made. This day is yours, pure generosity, given for moments of gentle reflection in the bustle of a day, well made. This moment is yours in entirety, a drop of time in an ocean of history, gifted with joy, well made. Amen. And a prayer of confession for today. Lord God, you have shown us such love and stretched out your arms to draw us into your embrace. Yet we so often fail to show that love within our lives or recognize its source. Forgive our short-sightedness for the times we've failed to see your love in the generosity of friend or stranger, the shoulder to cry on, the willing ear to listen, the word of encouragement, holding our hand for that extra mile. Forgive us for failing to notice how much you care for us. And here is good news for all who put their trust in Christ Jesus says, your sins are forgiven. Amen. Thanks be to God. Now Janice is going to read our Old Testament reading for today, which comes from Deuteronomy. This is from Deuteronomy 6. Moses is speaking to the people of Israel. Now this is the commandment, the statutes and the ordinances that the Lord your God charged me to teach you to observe in the land that you are about to cross into and occupy, so that you and your children and your children's children may fear the Lord your God all the days of your life and keep all his decrees and his commandments that I am commanding you so that your days may be long. Hear therefore, O Israel, and observe them diligently, so that it may well go well with you, and so that you may multiply greatly in a land flowing with milk and honey, as the Lord, the God of your ancestors, has promised you. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord alone. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. Keep these words that I am commanding you today in your heart. Recite them to your children and talk about them when you are at home and when you are away, when you lie down and when you rise. Bind them as a sign on your hand. Fix them as an emblem on your forehead and write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. Amen. This, passion, this passage, often uh, subtitled The Great Commandment, I thought I'd just reflect on it with you, just for a few moments. Because in this passage, we hear Moses speaking to the people that he's led across the desert and through the wilderness years. Moses' teachers are, of course, not his opinions, but their God-given revelation. He's delivering the words that Yahweh has given him. 
And this passage from Deuteronomy, which later came to be known as the Shema, is at the heart of the Jewish faith. It's named after the first word in the verse, the Hebrew for hear, hear, O Israel. And it's as familiar to the average Jew as the Lord's Prayer is to the average Christian. So it's not surprising that when asked which commandment would be, would be the, is the greatest, Jesus responded, as any faithful Jew would, by quoting the Shema. And we'll come back to Jesus' response in our Gospel reading from Mark later today. Now Deuteronomy 6.2 invites its hearers to understand this message is for God's people in perpetuity. It belongs to you, your children, and your children's children. The message is to be handed down for generations. Moses calls for his words to be heard and observed diligently, a reminder to be disciplined and methodical and habitual about spirituality in our homes. Today, the Shema is recited two times a day by observant Jews, and it's also one of the passages written out on parchment and encased in mezuzot, the small boxes on the doorposts of Jewish homes, and to fill in the small boxes worn on the forehead and arm during Jewish morning prayer services. Indeed, the practice of using mezuzot and tefillin can be tracked, traced back to that Moses instruction to bind them as a sign on your hand, fix them as an emblem on your forehead, and write them on the doorsteps of your house and on your gates. So what message might we draw from this ancient passage as Christians living today? Perhaps in a very simple form, it's this. It's that we should love God and worship him alone. But how can we do this? with all our life, with all our heart and our soul and our might. And why? Well, because he is alone is God and because he first loved us. When should we do this? Well, now and always, forevermore. And where should we do it? Everywhere. We should always be reminded of these words and seek to perpetuate them forever. I think this love for God is not just an emotional response, but it's a love based on our deep conviction about who God is and what he has done for us and what he expects from us in response. It's an active love. It's to love God with this single-minded, obedient allegiance is the heart of the message for us. Now, of course, John Wesley wrote about this, and what he said was, let your soul be filled with so entire a love for him that you may love nothing but for his sake. And he went on to pray, O oh, grant that nothing in my soul may dwell but thy pure love alone. O oh, may thy love possess me whole, my joy, my treasure, and my crown. Strange fires from my heart remove my every act, word, thought, be love. Amen. So as we think about that great verse, let's stand and sing together, singing the faith, number 501. Help us, O Lord, to learn the truths your word imparts.
it's really quite interesting because, as Janice said, I'm not a fully-fledged worship leader yet. I'm still in training. And the module I'm studying at the moment has actually dealt a lot with the Psalms. And quite often, the Psalm in the lectionary may be slipped over or people aren't quite comfortable with some of the words in the Psalm. But I actually felt that the Psalm in the lectionary for today really resonated with what we're thinking about in this service of worship. So I invite you to stay seated, but perhaps join me in saying together Psalm 18, sorry, Psalm 119, just the first eight verses, because it talks about the law of the Lord. And the version I'm suggesting we read from that I hope is the one displayed is the one from the Good News Bible. So join me in saying together the wonderful prayerful Psalm, happy are those whose lives are faultless, who live according to the law of the Lord. Happy are those who follow his commands, who obey him with all their heart. They never do wrong. They walk in the Lord's ways. Lord, you have given us your laws and told us to obey them faithfully. How I hope that I shall be faithful in keeping your instructions. If I pay attention to all your commands, then I will not be put to shame. As I learn your righteous judgments, I will praise you with a pure heart. I will obey your laws, never abandon me. And our New Testament reading, as I gave a little preview of, is from the Gospel of Mark. And Janice is now going to read Mark Chapter 12. From Mark 12, starting at verse 28. One of the scribes came near and heard them disputing with one another. And seeing that he answered them well, he asked him, Which commandment is the first of all? Jesus answered, the first is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. The second is this, You shall love your neighbour as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. Then the scribe said to him, You are right, teacher. You have truly said that he is one and beside him there is no other and to love him with all the heart and with all the understanding and with all the strength and to love one's neighbor as oneself this is much more important than all whole burnt offerings and sacrifices when jesus saw that he answered wisely he said to him you are not far from the kingdom of god after that, no one dared to ask him any questions. Amen. And the only thing we could sing after that was from singing the face 242, a new commandment I give unto you, and we'll sing it through twice.
So I'm sure our Gospel reading from Mark tells of an exchange that occurs during the last week before the crucifixion. And I'm sure it will be a reading that's familiar to you. Jesus is spending time in the temple courtyard, teaching the people and debating with Jewish religious and civil leaders. The Pharisees and Sadducees had asked their questions, probably in order to try and catch Jesus out. But one scribe asks a question which seems to genuinely seek the truth. Which is the most important commandment? Now, religious Judaism in the first century had identified 613 individual commandments of the law, and much time was therefore spent grading them according to their importance. And this was because keeping the commandments maintained a per person's place in the kingdom. So in responding to the scribe's question as to the number one law, Jesus actually gives a summary of the whole law. And the summary is based on the Deuteronomy reading that we heard earlier, and also from Leviticus, chapter 19, verse 18, which says, you shall not take vengeance or bear a grudge against any of your people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. And perhaps it's first significant to note that these two most important commandments are all about love. They're not about rules, they're about love. They say, love God, love your neighbor. So when I reflected on this reading and how to prepare for today's service, it raised two questions for me. Now a lot has been written about those passages, but two simple questions were raised for me. The first, so how do you love or how do you show the love of God in your life? Of course, I went and looked at what others had written. It's good to copy people if they've got good thoughts. And I found a lot of their thoughts actually really helpful, so I thought I'd share some of them with you. Love of God is our total dedication and commitment to God. It has to be a conscious decision to love God and something that we need to practice. To love God with all our heart is a daily challenge. Remembering God not only when we're in trouble, which is when we often turn to him, but remembering him every day. Prayer of whatever kind helps to keep God before our mind. And reading the Bible is also key to loving God. For as we read the gospel, we're reminded of who God is and what he has done for us. Now Jesus in the reading tells us that we must love God with all our hearts, our souls, our minds, our strength. Everything we are, everything we do, all of our Christian life is a response to the love of God. As it says in John, we love because he first loved us. The second question is, how do I love others as I love myself? Do I, do I feel called to love myself just as I am? Or does it make us feel quite guilty when I try to do so, feeling I'm being rather selfish? We need to remember that Jesus seems to imply to the contrary I won't be able to love others unless I love myself. The challenge in today's gospel reading is that to love your neighbor is to live out your faith in all the interactions, the conversations, even the arguments you have with others. That we do so in the knowledge that God is within all of us and that in loving our neighbor, we love God. In Luke's Gospel, Jesus defines our neighbour by telling the story of the Good Samaritan. But I sometimes wonder how this might be relevant to nowadays. There's lots of examples. But I went to the West End a few Saturdays ago, and I went to see a musical called Come From Away. Now, I don't know if any of you have seen it. Uh, my apologies if you have. Um, if you haven't, please do think about going or watching it. There's a film of it now because it's a great musical. In brief, 
It's set in the wake of September the 11th attacks on the USA. And it tells the very true story of what happened when 38 large planes were ordered to land unexpectedly in the small town of Gander. Now, Gander, I had to look up, it's in the very far northeast of Newfoundland, Canada. It's a tiny speck on the map. But it's where, originally, there was a big airfield, because when all the planes used to hop across to America, they needed to refuel, and Gander was the first point of land where they could land and refuel. So it had a big airstrip. And suddenly, now a tiny township with very few plane movements coming in, but this tiny township of just a few thousand people in the middle of nowhere had to cope with over 7,000 passengers coming off these massive planes. And these people who landed had no idea where they were and no idea what had happened in New York. So the stranded passengers were from different countries, they spoke different languages, they came from different cultures, they were scared, they were confused, and they had to immediately be housed and fed by the people of this tiny township and a few neighboring towns. The planes were actually grounded at Gander for over three days. And during that time, the locals used all their resourcefulness to feed and house these people and take the strangers that had landed in their midst to their hearts. They dealt with their practical needs, they opened their homes to them, they gave them clean clothes because they couldn't get their luggage off the planes. They gave them sh a shower because they'd been sitting on the planes, some of them for 36 hours, when they were finally allowed to get off. They gave them places to sleep. They gave them food to eat. They had to hope, cope with the different diets that these people needed. But the residents of Gander didn't just do the practical stuff. They did it really well. They used all their resources but they also recognized the emotional needs. They had to help these people cope with the enormity of what had happened. Some of them had relatives in New York. They didn't know what was happening to them. They had to talk about their stories. They had to share their worries. And these residents had to share those stories and show their care for them. Now, initially, this small community in Gander had suspicions and fears about some of the strangers. They knew what had happened and who had caused it. And these were foreigners who had landed amongst them. But in that short space of time, suspicions and fears were overcome. And actually strong bonds were formed between the two communities. And those bonds lasted years beyond the few days of their shared existence. Now, it's a wonderful show, it's uplifting, it's got great sort of Irish-themed music. But what you know all the time, what you're watching, is stories of people that really existed, of events that really happened. And actually, it's so uplifting that in the midst of that terror and devastating event, we see this uplifting reminder of the capacity for human kindness, even in the darkest of times the triumph of humanity over hate. And it exemplifies really what love for others, what love for your neighbor, whoever they may be, what it really looks like. So just to come back to my second question, Jesus said that we should love God and love others as ourselves. So how can I do this? How can we do this? Well, so often happens, John Wesley helps provide the answer for us. He gives a wonderful description of how one might obey these great commandments. He says, do all the good you can, by all the means you can, in all the ways you can, in all the places you can, at all the times you can, to all the people you can, as long as ever you can powerful words. So let us show love in action through our actions and our interactions with God and with others today and every day.
Amen. And Janice will now lead us in our prayers of concern for today. People often think that this part of our prayer time is when we ask God for things or when we tell him what he wants him to do about things, something or someone or some situation. Jane asks the question, how can we show our love for God? One way you show you care for someone is by listening to them when they try to speak to you. So at the end of each section of our prayers now, there'll be a short, quiet time when you can give God the opportunity to speak to you. And if it isn't long enough, you can always try listening later. Let's pray together. God, you have given us a wonderful world to live in, but we haven't looked after it the way we should. As those in power meet in Glasgow for the UN Climate Change Conference this week, we pray that they will find workable solutions and put them into practice so that our children will still have a wonderful world to live in. I can't fix the problems of climate change, but I can do things to help. Recycle, cut my food waste, buy less single-use plastic. I'm listening, Lord. What can I do to protect your world and show I love you? We only live in one small part of your world, but how we live here matters. In all our local communities, there are people in need. The homeless, those on low incomes, those needing work, those who are ill, perhaps a centre for refugees. Usually here, there are people who want to help, like charity volunteers, social workers, medical staff or local council workers. Not special people, but people like us. I'm listening, Lord. What can I do in my community to show I love you? Our church communities seek to show your love to all who come to them. But in this fast-moving age, it's not always easy to know how to reach out to those who don't come in. We pray that your spirit will guide our ministers and leaders as we move forward after COVID. But we know we also need to be part of that move. I'm listening, Lord. What can I do in my church community to show I love you?
Lord, most of us have friends and families we love and who care for us, but we all have challenging times in life. So we pray now for those we know who are ill, lonely, distressed or mourning today, that they may know your peace and find relief. I'm listening, Lord. Who do I need to be there for to show I love you? Lord, it isn't always easy to follow you. We pray that your spirit will guide us, strengthen us, and reassure us as we grow in our love for you. I'm listening, Lord. Show me what I need to do next on my journey with you to show I love you. God does not ask us to make this journey with him on our own. So as fellow travellers, let's pray together as Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. And we continue in that sort of vein as we sing our next hymn. From Singing the Faith 249, Jesu, Jesu, fill us with your love.
actually stay standing just for a moment, and I think Janice is going to come and join me. And I knew that was going to happen at some point. I, uh, I hope you've um, had quite a bit to think about from today's service. Um, I don't apologise for that. Uh, it's interesting to think about the Great Commandment and then how we are fulfilling it, whether we are observing it, and how we love God and how we love others. So what I thought we'd uh, stand and do is, as we come to the end of this service, is I invite you to join me in a prayer of commitment, which is taken from singing the faith number 702. But it's a prayer of commitment that we take as we go out into our lives in this coming week. So if you'd like to join me, please do. Um, have we got it up? Oh, right. Oh, I apologise then. Please sit down and Janice and I will say it and I hope you will join in. We'll say it slowly um, and hopefully you'll be able to uh, uh, think around the words as we, as we speak them. I will I'll speak, speak out, out for, the, for those, those who, who have, have no, voices. no voices. I will, I will stand, stand up for, for the rights of all the oppressed. The oppressed. I, I will speak, speak truth and justice. justice. I'll, I'll defend, defend the poor and needy. needy. I, will I will lift up, up the weak in, in Jesus' name. I will speak out for those who have no choices. I will cry out for those who live without love. I will show God's compassion to the crushed and broken in spirit. I will lift up the weak in Jesus' name. Lord Jesus Christ, send us out with confidence in your word to tell the world of your saving acts and bring glory to your name. May the love of the Father, the tenderness of the Son, and the presence of the Holy Spirit gladden your heart and bring peace to your soul this day and all days. Amen. Let's conclude by reaching out to others, to our neighbours here and those online, and say the grace together. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen.